<laughs> hey, we're live. Okay. Hey. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Um, I'm Joe Hill. Uh, I'm the author of uh, The Fireman, Nosferatu, Heart Shape Box, uh, and other family favorites. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm here tonight um, on Livestream.com to... Uh, Live signing, <laughs> live signing .com to uh, to talk about the new book, um, Strange Weather, with my pal Paul Tremblay, who is the author of uh, several brilliant novels, oh, uh, including Head Full of Ghosts uh, and Disappearance at Devil Rock, which would both make fine Halloween presents. <laughs> I could not possibly recommend them more. Um, very Thank scary you. works of fiction. Um, and so, yeah, so we're going to talk and I guess we're just going to, we're just going to roll along. But I wanted to begin with an important story about the last time I was on camera and broadcast to a lot of people. And I remember I said something really profound about the most frightening horror films of all time. And I was into it. Um, I mean, these were like some quotes for the ages and I was sitting in a leather chair and as I leaned forward, the chair went <laughs> and and the thing is, the thing is, like I said, I posted the video because I was proud of, of what I said and I thought it made me sound yeah. smart. Um, but I also put a disclaimer, which is that's not me farting, that's the chair. No one believes that. It doesn't, you cannot sell that. Even if it's true, it was true. It's the chair. The chair was making that noise yeah. I mean, that's continuously. Why, that's one of the rules for that bodily function is doth protesting too much or thou yeah doth you just can't, you, what I what would have been better is if I just didn't say anything at all and people would have probably thought it was yeah, the mic you've been like what noise yeah 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 exactly people would have probably thought it was the mic or a technical problem or whatever but as soon as I mentioned by the way that farting sound is the chair <laughs> anyway yeah. it's wooden chairs wooden chair. tonight and that's very that's very intentional <laughs> so yeah okay uh, all right so hi uh, thank you for letting me be here uh, I'm serving as the moderator uh, so I, I guess I'm, I'm here to moderate, like uh, yeah. as to, to be moderate. You're my, we're not, we're yeah, not you're be my foil. Like over the top, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, so we are, just a reminder, we are here uh, in signed copies of, I'm going to hold it up. Yeah, okay. It's an actual real book. I thought it was going to be like an uh, empty cardboard <laughs> box of a book. Well, well, it's a real one. The other reason, the other reason Paul's here is because suppo the way this works is I'm supposed to be signing the books in front of you. So you, right. I guess so you know you it's not it. someone else's signature that it's actually mine. Um, and so Paul has to be here because there has to be someone <laughs> to make noises I'm out a notary. of there. Right, yeah. Well, no, I mean, not officially. he's got to say, someone's got to provide a soundtrack to say something because I can't talk and sign at the same time. My brain <laughs> completely switches off. And you'd think it's the same seven letters. I've been writing them for years. You'd think at this point I could just go on autopilot, but it's it's still right, tough. We'll see how that goes. So yeah. Um, All right. So we're going to talk about the book a little bit first, and then we'll open it up to fan questions. Oh yeah. Did you want to read too? Oh bit yeah. At some point? Yeah. Let me read a little bit from All the right. book. So, um, so to tell you about Strange Weather. So Strange Weather is a collection of four short novels: uh, Snapshot, uh, Loaded, Aloft, and Rain. Um, Loaded is a story about America's um, favorite uh, weekend pastime, which is the mass shooting. Um, Aloft is about a man who uh, goes on his first parachuting trip. It goes horribly wrong, and he winds up stranded on a mysteriously solid cloud 10,000 feet above Earth. Um, and he's a castaway there in the sky and has to figure out how to try to get down. And the third, uh, final story in the book is called Rain, um, which is about climate change, I guess. Uh, because in the story, the climate takes a definite change for the worst. Um, thunderclouds begin raining nails, and anyone who's caught out in the downpour is shredded to pieces. Um, so, but I'm going to read just a little taste from the first story, which is called Snapshot. Um, Snapshot is about the friendship uh, between, we've got um, um, a young boy of about 13 who lives in California, and he occasionally looks after uh, an elderly woman named Shelly Bukes, who um, seems to be losing her memory to old age, um, to dementia. Um, but Shelly says that in fact her memories are being stolen by someone called the Phoenician, who has a Polaroid camera that steals memories. And gradually our hero comes to believe 
uh, that Shelley is correct and that the Phoenician is out there. And so um, one night he is asked to look after her and he believes it's possible that the Phoenician is coming after her as well. And so this is a scene, it's a, it is a, a classically dark and stormy night. And um, our, our narrator is rushing to Shelley's house uh, in the middle of um, a tremendous uh, building downpour. I'll just read a little bit. When I opened the door, the wind hit me with a shove, a guest banging past me and reeling drunkenly into the house. I had to back my way out, hunching my shoulders against the gale. But when I got around the corner and was on my way up to the Bukes house, I had the wind at my back. The gusts ran at me, turning my light windbreaker into a sail and carrying me along at a trot. A house on the corner was on the market, and as I went by, the real estate agent's metal sign, which was pitching back and forth, snapped free and soared 20 feet before doing a meat cleaver, whap, into the soft dirt of someone's front yard. I did not feel I was walking to Shelley's house so much as I was being blown there. A fat, warm drop of water splattered the side of my face, just like a mouthful of spit. The wind surged, and a burst of rain, barely a dozen drops, struck the blacktop ahead of me, producing the smell that is one of the finest odors in the world, the fragrance of hot asphalt in a summer shower. A sound began to build behind me, a thunderous rattle that I could feel in my teeth. It was the sound of torrential downpour driving into trees and against tar paper roofs and parked cars, a mindless, continuous roar. I picked up my pace, but what was coming couldn't be outrun, and in three more steps it caught me. It came down so hard that the rain bounced when it hit the road, creating a shivering, knee-high billow of spray. Water began to pour into storm drains in a brown, foaming flood. It was amazing how quickly it happened. It seemed like I ran fewer than ten steps before I was splashing ankle-deep. A plastic pink flamingo rushed past, carried by the tide. Lightning popped, and the world became an X-ray photograph of itself. I forgot my plan. Did I even have a plan? You couldn't think in a storm like that. I fled through pelting water, cut across the yard of the house next to Shelley's. Only the lawn was melting. It came apart under my heels, long runners of grass peeling up to reveal the waterlogged earth beneath. I fell, went down on one knee, caught myself with my hands, and came up filthy and wet. And I staggered on across the Bukes' driveway, which was, wide, which was a wide and shallow canal by then, and around at the back of the house. I scrabbled at the screen door and leapt inside as if I were on the run from wild dogs. The door banged behind me, only slightly less loud than a crack of thunder, which was when I remembered I'd been aiming for stealth. The kitchen was still and shadowed. I had sat there plenty of times in the past, munching Shelley Bukes' date cookies and sipping tea, and it had always been a place of pleasant smells and reassuring odor. order. Now, though, there were dirty plates in the sink. The garbage can overflowed, flies crawling on heaped paper towels and plastic bottles. I listened, but couldn't hear anything except the rain rumbling on the roof. It sounded like a train going by. The screen door opened behind me and slammed again, and I choked on a scream. I spun, ready to drop to my knees and begin begging, but there was no one there. Just wind. I pulled the screen door tight, and almost immediately a fresh gust overpowered the old latch and sucked the screen open once more, then thumped it shut. I didn't bother to secure it again. My inside squirmed at the thought of going any farther into the house. I felt strongly that the Phoenician was already there, had heard me coming in and was patiently waiting for me somewhere in the gloom, down the hall and around the corner. I opened my mouth to call hello, then thought better of it. What finally got me moving wasn't courage, but manners. A puddle was forming under my feet. I snatched a dish towel and wiped it up. It gave me a way to stall going any further into the house. I liked it close by the screen door, where I could get outside in two steps. Finally, the floor was dry. I was still wet, though, and needed a towel myself. I edged over to the doorway and stuck my head around the corner. A dim and lonely hall awaited. I crept down the corridor. I peeked. I nudged open each door as I came to it, and the Phoenician was in every room. He was in the tiny home office, standing motionless in one corner. I spotted him in my peripheral vision, and my pulse did a hectic jig. And I looked again and saw it was only a coat rack. He was in the guest bedroom, too. Oh, at first glance, the place seemed empty. 
It could have been a room in a Motel 6 with its neatly made queen-size bed, striped wallpaper, and modest TV. The door to the closet, though, was slightly ajar, and as I stared at it, it seemed to wobble slightly, as if it had only just been pulled closed. I could feel him in there, holding his breath. It took all the will I possessed to walk the three steps to the closet. When I threw open the door, I was prepared to die. The little cabinet within contained a collection of curious costumes, a pink jumpsuit with a fur collar, white silks of the sort Elvis Presley liked to wear in the 70s, but no psychopaths. Finally, only the door to the master bedroom remained. I gently turned the knob and carefully pushed it inward. The screen door in the kitchen chose that exact moment to bang once again, going off like a pistol shot. So, hey. yeah. Oh, you're getting the sign. Mm. Oh, I should sign books. Right, <laughs> someone is reminding me of what I actually am supposed to be, of my job. All right, so as you're signing, I will sure. say, I want to expose one uh, dirty truth about the book. Uh, since it's four short novels, they're really novellas. <laughs> <laughs> someone said, I read somewhere online a, a couple years ago, someone said um, that novella is sort of an annoying word. Yeah, you no know, one really, I guess, other than like, I don't know, people who read a lot and annoying writers know what a novella is. And, it and, would be what I guess. And very arbitrary. I mean, is um, Heart of Darkness a novel or a novella? I don't know. I know for the Shirley Jackson Awards, which is something I help run, uh, we arbitrarily define the novella to be between 17,500 words and 39,000 words. Something like that? Not all of them, just some yeah. of them. The, I've got a doodle, right. but I can't do it in all of them. Uh, so, yeah, the Shirley Jackson Awards is really cool. The great thing about the Shirley Jackson Awards is everyone knows the story of the lottery, um, which is where this New England town, this bucolic uh, New England town, has a lottery every year, and if you lose, the rest of the town pelts you to death with stones. And what's great about the Shirley Jackson Awards is <laughs> if you're a runner-up, but you don't win, you get a stone, get a stone yeah. um, with your name engraved in it, uh, which makes it really weird for the winner to go up and accept the, the Absolutely, award. Absolutely, yes. We, we've yet to have an actual live stoning, but maybe if we're around for another 10 years, there will be one. Um, and before we get to some fan questions, let me just ask you, so it is four short novels. Right. So I want to know, um, did you go into the writing of each of these thinking, man, this is going to be a short story, or this might be a novel, and they sort of just ended up sort of at this in-between space, or did you aim to write novellas? Well, I had written a couple pretty long books. Yeah. Uh, Nosferatu, my third novel, was 700-odd pages. The Fireman, my fourth novel, was about 750-something pages. Um, and, and I like long books. I think long books are great, you know? There's nothing, there's nothing more fun than having a huge, immersive world with lots of characters to get lost in and, and swim in for a month. Um, but I think if that's all you do, you risk becoming the bore at the party, right. you know, and there's a lot to be said for economy. And a lot of my favorite stories, especially, especially, um, stories of dread really live at that length of about 80 to 150 pages. Yeah. You know, um, I think about, uh, the woman in black by Susan Hill, no relation. Um, you know, wonderful book, intensely scary, um, you know, only about 180 pages long, 150 pages long. Turn of the Screw, Henry James, right. it's 130 pages. Uh, my favorite of Neil Gaiman's works, Ocean at the End of the, la la end of the Lane, um, is just, there's not, a, it, there, it's not one word longer than it needs to be, and it's about 185 pages, I right. think. Um, very lean novel. Um, but it's like, you know, um, it's like an atom is tiny, but if you split it, it has tremendous power. And that's like Ocean at the End of the Lane and, you know, some of these other stories. The North Korean version. The, <laughs> you should split Adam, I was just thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, um, uh, so anyway, so I wanted to write, I wanted to work shorter, and then, and then I wrote the first one of these stories, Snapshot, while I was on tour for Nosferatu. And I wanted to get away from my phone. I spent too much time looking at the phone and I'm really sick of it. And I thought, what can I do except besides look at the phone while I'm on tour? And I thought, I can buy a notebook and I can write a short story. But Snapshot wound up filling all of one notebook 
and I was stuck in a 1950s diner when I finished the first notebook uh -huh. and I used the placemat and wrote like three, you <laughs> oh, know, wow. I wrote like a thousand words in the back of one placemat. I bought another notebook and I, you know, I, and I finished the story in that and I got it done and I, I knew it was too long to be a short story, but too short to be its own novel. Right. So I just wrapped it up in rubber bands and put it on a shelf and forgot about it. Um, about 18 months later, I finished writing The Fireman and I, I wrote it in these giant Lexstrom 1917 notebooks, these huge ledger-like notebooks. And um, when I got done, I had about half of them, half of one still empty, mm -hmm. and I hate to let all that blank paper go to waste. <laughs> so I wrote Aloft, and again, it wasn't a novel, but even if I fiercely edited it, I could feel that it wasn't going to be a 20-page short story. Right. It had It had... A lot of character and backstory in it and and I liked it I didn't really want it to be smaller um, and that's when I started to think maybe I'm working on a book of three or four short novels and the advantage of the short novel is you get all the velocity of a short story but you get the depth of characterization and the complication of theme the exploration of theme that you get in a novel or at least that's the theory right now, I don't know who said it first, but it's, it seems to be an old saw within the horror writing community that horror is almost uh, best at the short novel yeah. novella form. I don't know who said that first. Maybe it was Ricardo Maltaban. I'm pretty was, sure. But... I'm pretty sure that is. He, uh, I think he said that on Fantasy Island, um, second or third season. Yeah. yeah. All right. Should we jump into fan questions? Fan questions? Let's the have fan questions. The magic of my uh, iPad. Can I... They're not sponsoring. <laughs> With the tablet. Through our the generic tablet, tablet yes. our entirely generic tablet. That I get to keep, right, for my moderating uh, duties here? All right. I was just saying before we went live, <laughs> I was just talking about, you know, how, how depressed sometimes social media makes me. I say as I advertise my book on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but sometimes, sometimes social media makes me really sad. And then I was thinking about looking at my phone and my iPad too much and about how my devices make me kind of sad. And then uh, I was saying to Paul, I think what I, what I really hate is the future. And I, I yearn for the days um, when you could count on dying by 28 of tetanus. With like your jaw frozen Locked shut, shut. Yeah, that's a good yeah you know, um, um, you know, it's all been downhill since penicillin. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, yeah, so onward. There, speaking of penicillin, now uh, it's time to take my medicine. Let's just, we'll start off with because it's the first one on the list. It's Boris from Reichen. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Norway. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Hmm. Do I have any advice to aspiring? authors that's original that's not like i mean if you if you googled advice for aspiring authors probably everything i would say would yeah. come up like on the first hit yeah well, just one thing off the top of your head like um i guess i guess i would say never sit down at the beginning of your day to write a novel it's a waste of time don't sit down to write a short story um or a play or a screenplay or it's just that's those are those goals are too ambitious um, just sit down and write one good scene. That's all. Um, a short story is nothing more than one to three really good scenes that connect. And a novel is nothing more than a stack of very good scenes that have some kind of through line. So when you sit down to work, you know, put the idea of writing your novel out of, out of your head and just think, you know, now today I'm going to write one awesome scene that will be fun for other people to read. Um, you know, something, something I can share that are going to, that's going to amp people up to read the next good scene. That's terrible advice. Don't do it. Tape, I know. It was... Tape the pen to your hand and just free write whatever happens. I'm just kidding. That's excellent advice, of course. Here, I'm going to give you an easy, easy one. To do answer. you know when you start, Paul, when you start, do you know, do you outline? Sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'm forced to. <laughs> Which makes me your publisher asked happy. for an the publisher yeah, asked for an right. outline. Um, but for some novels, I have outlined first because I f I'm not. I feel like I'm not good enough to make a plot as I go because plot for me is the hardest. Yeah, I feel like what comes to me easiest is characters. Um, a head full of ghosts. I did not outline first. That I, I just sort of had the idea and I went with it. Disappearance of Devil's Rock. I spent months outlining, just trying to figure out. Because it really almost has like a mystery novel structure. Yeah, it does. So I kind of, I, I, I wanted to, even though things change from the outline to the actual novel, 
I wanted to have some semblance of what was going to be. I want to quiz him. Um, <laughs> Disappearance at Devil Rock uh, um, is, you know, a great story about a, a disappearing child and and who may have been taken by forces beyond our world, or maybe not. It's right. hard to tell. Um, but it also has an interesting thing going on with the Joyce Carol Oates story, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been, which right. is probably one of the greatest short stories Perfect, ever yeah. written. Yeah. I mean, I read that story in college when I was a math major. A deeply, my first... <laughs> a deeply sinister story and Absolutely. excellent Halloween season reading. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, that story, I mean, it sounds cheesy. It changed my life. I mean, I read that story... Uh, like I said, I took a random English class in college because I was a math major. And when I read, where are you going, where have you been? I remember thinking, wow, I didn't know people wrote stuff like this. Mm. Um, all right, so I promised you an easy question. Okay. I don't want to lie. Uh, where'd it go? This is from Daniel. Um, I'm not, I can't pronounce that. Sorjan? Maulung Salin? I assume it's in Sweden. Hi, mm -hmm. will you ever do a book tour in Sweden? Yes. Yes. That was an easy one. That was an easy yes. question. I will, I will get to Sweden. Um, do, I would like, love to go to Sweden. Um, um, I think that would be excellent. Okay. That's my really thoughtful. Yeah, I, everyone, I'm sure people out there in internet land yeah. thought I was about to segue into something interesting, but actually I got nothing. I mean, except that I would really love to see, you know, all those sort of frozen northern countries, um, which are the setting for so many great games of Ticket to Ride. You know, if you only have three people to play Ticket to Ride with, it's really all... Norway, Sweden, yeah. okay. Denmark. Great train game. T probably my favorite board game. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, right. go ahead. Um, how about Christine? Brooklyn, Wisconsin. That was a, a curveball there. Wow, yeah. Uh, do you believe in absolute unredeemable evil? I don't know if she means do you believe in it as like a life choice. Yeah. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> right. Um... Do I believe, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really think, I, I think, you know, um, it's impossible to look at something like the Holocaust and not right. believe um, in, you can believe people live for almost a total good, you know, and you, so you have to accept that it's also possible for people to live absolutely destructive, poisonous lives. You don't even have to really have any religious beliefs to believe that you can, Choose to live a life which brings happiness and opportunities and good things into the lives of the people around you, or to live a life which is destructive and toxic and and you know when you hurt as many people as possible and and um, so yeah. Good answer. Um, I'm not quite sure what this means, so I'm going to ask it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, I think I do know what this means. Allison from Vermilion, Ohio. What a yeah, great name for yeah, Vermilion. Cool Do you think they make yeah. up the town names? Maybe that's made up. I bet it's made up. Because it's not Vermilion, Ohio. <laughs> Come on. Are you adding any more cities to the United Inscapes of America? So in Nosferatu, uh, my third novel is the story of a very bad man who has a car that runs on human souls instead of gasoline, Charlie Manx. And the car flickers in and out of our world. His, his uh, Rolls Royce Wraith um, can take him out of our world and into a kind of thought world, um, a world created of ideas instead of um, actual stuff. And in this thought world, in these, he, everyone has an inscape. And so, so it's, it's based on this idea, which I actually happen to believe, which is that people live their world, live their entire lives in two separate worlds, the actual physical world, and then the world they invent for themselves inside their heads. Um, and, and Nosferatu just takes that idea and says, maybe for some people are, have the power to make those inner worlds tangible and real. And so Charlie Manx has a, a, a world, an inscape called Christmas Land, which is where he takes abducted children after he's, he's done draining them of their essence. And there are other inscapes mentioned in in the story. Um, the Treehouse of the Mind, which is a location in Horns, is referenced and um, um, it's implied that that is also an inscape. Um, I mentioned a place called Orphanhenge, and I sometimes think that Orphanhenge will be a novel. Um, hmm. I have an idea about that place, and that's an Orphanhenge is an inscape as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I kind of think some of my, not all my stories, but some yeah. of my stories are in a shared 
continuous universe. And um, that is the universe where inscapes are possible. Um, and I'm sure there will be more of that in the future. Because um, I'm too lazy to think up yeah. something new. <laughs> All right. Vermilion. Nice, nice question. Good question. Uh, actually, I think I, I asked you a form of this in email just randomly after reading something related to Jaws. Uh, this is from Annie in Augusta, Maine. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider tackling a work of nonfiction? If so, what would the topic be? One of my literary idols, John D. MacDonald, um, wrote the Travis McGee stories of crime novels and a terrific mid-century American writer of, of crime. Um, uh, and he wrote a few works of nonfiction. He wrote one about laughing, mm -hmm. about the behind the scenes workings oh, really? of, of laughing. That. Isn't yeah. that strange? Yeah, isn't that strange. Uh, isn't that weird? And he also wrote at least one true crime novel. And I've thought for a long time that it would be instructive to write a work of true crime. Um, but I don't know if I ever will because again I'm terribly lazy and yeah. and I don't know if I I don't know if I could bear to do all the research no, that the, would be required yeah. the interviews for me I mean not to butt in but research is so terribly uh, intimidating to me yeah like, I'm much better at just making stuff up yeah there are writers <laughs> there are writers um, who who research. Oh, they love research. research. Yeah. yeah, they they go in depth, and they're writers who just like to make shit up. And I I've always been I've always been the latter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I saw Jim Shepard, who I think is a wonderful writer. Wow, he's good. Uh, but yeah, he's someone who just researches the hell out of something. Another great Halloween story by Jim. It's by the author Jim Shepard. Is called Tedford and the Megalodon. Tedford and the yeah. Megalodon is like one of the it's one of the great shock stories of the last fifteen years and has not received yeah. its public due. And he had, and he wrote a short story called Creature from the Black Lagoon from the point of view of the creature, which is just wonderful. Wait, did he also do is now I might be getting confused with another another writer, but did he also do a story about no, the filming of Nosferatu, implying yes. that yep. implying that the it vampire was, was real? Yeah. yeah, it's a short novel, and then yeah. it was made into the film, and William Defoe plays. Or are they not the same? Not the same, but he did do a Nosferatu short novel, right? Yeah. And and in it, I believe, I believe in the, I haven't read it, but I believe in the book he implies that the Max Schreck was actually a vampire, which is pretty cool. I love that kind of thing, but I might be wrong. I might be wrong about that yeah, detail. I might be conflating a couple things. I might be conflating okay. something. Yeah, because there's a William it's Defoe the film. No one will correct us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are allowed to be wrong on the yes. internet. Everyone else is. Christopher from Wayne, New Jersey. Um, all right, I'll read the question, even though you're from a town that's a name. I, I don't like towns that are names. Yeah. Well, even though I guess most of them are, probably, right? On some level. Anyway, are you ever intimidated by a book you are writing? <laughs> uh, I'm intimidated every day I every... sit down. I think, oh, God, I have to do this again. Yeah. <laughs> what if I can't today? You know, what if I don't think of anything good? And the way, the way to get over being intimidated is to just write one really short sentence. You know, it's just not that. It's just, you know, a four or five word. I love a two word, you know, I love a two word sentence. I love a sentence like thunder detonated, you know? And if I write a sentence like that, you know, it's not much, it doesn't mean much uh -huh. or anything. It just is a little bit of scene setting, but it gets me going, you know? And then, then, and then I can do, I can be a little more ambitious ambitious with sentence number two. Anytime you're reading one of my books and you come across like a two word sentence, I started my day of work there. You can tell. I just gave away something I probably shouldn't give away because now everyone who goes through the book is going to be like, uh, oh, we'll I be, nodded. We'll yep, be, he started his day there. We'll be awaiting the, the uh, short novel that's just all two-word sentences. Let's see. I'm, I'm looking around now. I'm like, I wonder how many two-word sentences there are. Well, go on. Yeah. Uh, here's a question I've never asked anybody before, but it's not my question, so I'm not going to take credit for right. it. It's from Aaron in Lexington, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. What's your? Third? I'm going to be in Lexington on tour oh. at the Joseph Beth um, in like uh, almost exactly a week. All right. Yeah. Well, maybe you can tell. So me I could have answered this in person. Why are you course. wasting our time for? No, go ahead. <laughs> What's your third favorite ice cream? We don't want your first or second, so you got to do that silently in your head. What's your third? Do I have to do? I have to do the. I have to cream? do it. I have to do it silently in my head, so we don't want to <laughs> give away the fun. Um. I guess my third favorite ice cream. Um, All right, you don't have to do it silently. No, I'm trying to think. I mean, the <laughs> favorite ice cream is strawberry. 
Um, the second favorite is vanilla. I guess my third favorite would be chocolate. I mean, I I you know are, that's not cool. Neapolitan I know, I box. know that's not cool. I didn't oh, come up with something boy. awesome, you know, an inventive. So you love the Neapolitan box. I, I do it. love the Neapolitan I always, I would box. I eat the vanilla, like extract it, and, and then the strawberry, and leave the chocolate. Well, so I else. extract the strawberry <laughs> first. I work through the strawberry yeah. first. But sometimes you just want a vanilla milkshake, and then yeah. sometimes you just want a big scoop of chocolate ice cream with like whipped cream and, yeah. and nuts and stuff on it. So yeah. I'm terribly disappointed. I'm sure Aaron is as well. Uh, Hey, Daniel from Aurora, Colorado. I was born in Aurora, even though I only lived there for really? like nine months of my life. Mm. Um, it was like one month at a time we moved. Then we moved back for another month. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I lived in uh, I lived in Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado yeah. as well, but I have I have virtually no memory of it. But yeah, yeah I, have that's, that's, I was, was like from zero to nine months, and then now same it's a same with me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, since I have a beard as well, I want to know. He's he, or Daniel wants to know what is your grooming routine for that amazing beard? No sarcasm. I think he's implying he's not being sarcastic. Truthfully, truthfully, I get over to the United Kingdom um, about once a month, and when I'm over there, um, I, I try to hit someone who can who can groom the beard. And if you, if I can get it done once a month, um, uh -huh. that's you know, um, that's I sort of I sort of. Um, I sort of half, almost kind of like, one, I don't live there, sort of like a third kind of live in the, yeah, it's weird. Anyway, yeah. let's go on. Okay. Yeah. Um, Angela from Central City, Kentucky. That's all in caps, so I don't know if that's Central City, Kentucky. <laughs> That'd be a cool place to live. Everyone's just shouting at everybody. Uh, what is a book that you could read over and over? I'm sure there are many, but. Many. What's... There are many books I could read over and over, and many books I have read over and over. I've read The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs over and over. I've read The Dead Zone by my dad over and over. I love that book. I've read uh, The Thousand Autumns of Jacob DeZoot and Cloud Atlas several oh, wow. times. Yeah. Um, I've read Stranger Things Happen by Kelly Link several times. Um, I learned how to read, I learned how to write short stories um, by reading uh, the Specialist Hat by Kelly Link three or four times and underlining and making notes. Nice. And that's sort of how I deconstructed writing a story. Um, um, Watership Down. Love Watership Down. So, Amazing book, absolutely. Um, yeah. You didn't ask me, but I would just throw out. I used to have a little... I am one. I am curious, though. What do <laughs> I used you to have a little tradition where I would reread every June. I don't know why June. Maybe it was more like an end of the school year sort of celebration thing for me. Uh, I would reread Kurt Vonnegut's um, Slaughterhouse Five and Breakfast of Champions every June. I'd love to read Slaughterhouse Five again. Um, I think probably my favorite Vonnegut is the Book of Stories. Is Welcome to the Monkey House. Hmm. I raise. I have three teenage boys, so I identify. <laughs> I, I, I live in the. I live in the I monkey raise house. Monkeys, yes. Um, all right, uh, Alicia okay. from Tucson, Arizona. What do you do when you face writer's block? I don't have it. I just don't. That's just not don't like I did, just right. the, the. Let me tell you about writer's block. Let me explain writer's block to you. Okay. So the deal with writer's block is that happens when there's a story you want to write, and and your conscious mind is horrified. You know, like there's a story you want to write about masturbation, compulsive <laughs> masturbation, and and your conscious mind is like, holy shit, I can't write that. What if my mom reads that story? And your subconscious says, fine, don't want to play? I'll take my ball and go home. And so you can't think of anything else to write because you are your own enemy. You are standing in the way of what the subconscious wants to spit out. Yeah. There's only one thing you can do. Write the <laughs> masturbation story. Write the compulsive <laughs> masturbation story. And it's and, called The Loft. It's, it's called no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, and honestly, your mom already knew. You know, <laughs> you're, not, you're not actually stunning her. Well, you mentioned Kelly Link earlier, and uh, who has never written about compulsive masturbation. Not. But if she did, but I know I'd she, read it because she's, she's awesome. But she's talked about very similar to what you said. She described the subconscious almost like to treat it like a dog. And if your dog is going to bring you a toy, and you keep just like ignoring it, like, eh, it's going to stop doing yeah. these things. And your yeah. subconscious is very much like, you know, you want to train it like a dog. You want to reward it for bringing you ideas. Yeah, you have to play. Yep. We agree. Um, Brian from Plant City, Florida. Okay. Plant City, Florida. I don't That's know. cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Sir. Not as cool as Vermilion. Vermilion so far is the town is of the, the night. Town. That sounds like such a Frank Baum town. <laughs> like, doesn't it sound like Dorothy is from like, I'm from Vermilion, Kansas. Ohio. That's well, it was, it was Ohio, but it's, you know, Dorothy Just was from being Kansas. Accurate. So, okay. Sir, right. what is the scariest and favorite graphic novel you have ever read or recommend? 
Love Lock and Key, by the way. Um, so scariest and or favorite graphic novel. Well, you know, so um, so when I grew up, I read comics uh, every day. I loved comics. I have a very comic book imagination. But I was never really a big cape guy. I never really read a lot of superhero stuff. Yeah. You know, I read The X-Men by Chris Claremont. And, and by the way, and by the way, there's a lot of talk about diversity in fiction today. And I just think people need to give Chris Claremont his props for being wildly ahead of the curve in the sense of when he presented the X-Men, you know, just sort of non-controversially, you know, included everyone, every ethnic ethnicity, um, you know, um, every gender identification, and no one even thought it was weird. No one was even like, wow, this is a bold, daring step. That was just the X-Men. Right. And I, you know, and I think it's because he understood all along that being a mutant, mutant was, was a metaphor for being someone that society sees as different. And so he immediately grasped onto that and, and ran with it. And, but anyway, I, but all this is getting off the point. I didn't really read a lot of superhero comics when I was a kid. Um, my dad had all of the Tales from the Crypt comic books in hardcover. The EC reprints, it was uh, a couple other ones too. Uh, what, Tomb of Horror? Is that right? Tales Tomb, from the Crypt? Tomb of Dracula? No, I mean, Tomb of Dracula is Marvel. It's Marvel. Um, I'm not a well, they're going to take away my horror cred card <laughs> tonight because I can't remember all the EC, all C comic, uh, yeah. the EC comics. Uh, but but those Tales from the Crypt was the most famous. And there were a bunch of others in the series. And, you know, they were these great, gross, grotty revenge stories like this, you know, this woman... You know, she finds out her husband, he's pretending to go bowling, but he's actually cheating on her with the other woman, you know, and she gets revenge by hacking off his head. And the final panel is she's bowling with his, his head and his eyes have been pulled out. And I was just like, you know, I was nine. And I was like, ah! And I mean that in a happy way. I was like, ah! You know, and um, so I would say Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, okay, wait, 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 but now, now the gears are clicking into place. Okay. Um, Sandman is probably the greatest work of dark fantasy um, mm -hmm. ever committed to comics. And when I wrote Lock and Key, I just wanted it to be baby Sandman. I just wanted it to be like mini, okay. you know, like uh, the mini me version of Sandman. Um, um, and, and I would also say that almost everything I know about writing character, I learned from reading Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing. Oh, yeah. Love yeah. Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Actually. Yeah. I'm not... I didn't grow up reading a ton of comics when I, I mean, I'm old enough that, you know, I would go to the barber, he would give me old Spider-Man, so hmm. I just read the comics that my barber gave me. Um, but, you know, as I've become older, I definitely read a lot more comics. And you I ever would, thought about writing comics? Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind giving it a shot. I mean, I would have no idea how to do it. I would have to have someone help me. <laughs> no, just the format, but yeah, yeah. no, I've, I've toyed around with it fairly recently a little bit. Um, I would recommend, I enjoy Harrow County right now for a new horror comic. I read I read a, a stunning recommendation of a book called Through the Woods by Emily Carroll. Oh yes, it's great. I haven't read it yet, but I hear it's awesome. And I, you know, I read this thing and I got completely stoked. So no, uh, that, so that is. I'll probably read that yes, this week. It is amazing. Uh, all right. Oh, I had a good one. I lost it. Where'd it go? Um. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Since we still have the stacks here, from Alan in okay. Temple Terrace, Florida. Mm -hmm. What is the strangest weather you've weathered? Hmm. Strangest weather I've weathered. When I was um, uh, very small, I don't remember the exact age, I lived on Long Lake in Maine, and a water spout walked down the lake. Um, a water spout is like um, uh, uh, a fun tornado, like a tornado of fun and water. Okay. And um, and it whipped down the lake, walked down the whole length of the lake. And I remember the next day walking along, there's a, a, a road that runs that bisects um, uh, Long Lake. And the whole length of the road was covered in dead fish. And I remember throwing some of the fish back. Cause I, was oh, wow. kinda, I was kind of hopeful that maybe if they got a drink, they'd be okay again. But they weren't okay. <laughs> yeah, they don't drink. Well, maybe they do, right? They, they have to Do drink. fish drink? Uh, I don't know. They have to, right? Don't they need water? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I have, I have no clue. Yeah. Well, I feel really not smart now. Uh, Christine, Villa Rica, Georgia. Mm. What was your favorite book growing up? Well, I've already mentioned one of them, and so so I should be inventive and think of something different. The House okay. with the Clock and Its Walls was my favorite, okay. you know, favorite book as a child. Um, and still probably the book I've read the most. 
Um, I had to deal with my parents uh, that I had to go to bed at 9, but I could stay up to 9.30 if I was reading. And so um, um, I read all of the Sherlock Holmes stories over a course of 60 nights. It took me four nights to read one of the novels and one night to read the short stories. And so probably the Sherlock Holmes stories. And I was just going to, I just want to mention that um, I recently rent, went back and read The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, and I was a little bit disappointed, actually. Mm. I remember this, this uh, tremendous atmosphere of menace and the grotesque and you know romance and excitement it was actually they were actually very mild it's very yeah. it's very it's very mild tea my son's high school they're doing in a couple of weeks uh a play based on some sherlock holmes I, I don't i forget what sherlock holmes it's based off of but they're doing a play and he's mm. going to be in it who's it going to be he, uh I, I forget he's <laughs> comic relief he doesn't want he wants me like to not know much until i see the play he'd rather me just see it as opposed to he might, into his character. I wonder if he's doing William Gillette's Sherlock Holmes, which was actually a terrific, you know, it was like a 19th century production and, and in some ways still has not been surpassed as, yeah. a, as an adaptation of the, the great detective to stage. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Are we going on to two minutes? Yeah, uh, there's 22 like, questions in two minutes. Okay, so 22 questions in two minutes for those playing along at home. Okay. Is that going to make you seasick if I do that? <laughs> two minutes, who's got the timer? I don't. All right, you ready? Yeah, let's go for it. Who inspires you most? Do I, have, I still have another minute and fifty-eight seconds. <laughs> yeah. Um, who inspires me? Who inspires me most? Um, wow, this turned out to be tougher than. Um, this turned out to be tougher than I. <coughs> yeah, I know, I know. My mom. My mom. Wrong. It's your dog. Who is the most unexpected person in your phone? Oh God, the most unexpected person on my phone? Yeah. These are tough questions to Come only on. have two minutes to answer. What the hell is that? Um, the most, I also feel like this is like an invitation to name drop, like, wow, I got this one famous person on my phone, I'm gonna boast to everyone about it. Uh, I don't know. Um, the most unexpected person in my phone? Probably my yeah. dentist? Is that unexpected? <laughs> That's unexpected. He's not on my phone, or my dentist is on my phone. Anyway, sorry. Who makes you laugh the most? My kids. Who would you want to play? Uh, who would you want to play you in a movie? Dave Grohl. Wrong. Owen King. I'm just yeah, kidding. Owen would be good too. <laughs> five. What is really to five? What is the weirdest thing a fan has ever said to you? Um. Well, I don't know what the weirdest thing. A fan has ever said to me, but I, I know once I did a signing, it was like in Iowa, and a guy waited to the end of the line, he came up to me and he said, your your stories have given me so much pleasure that I wanted to give you something. And he gave me this <laughs> old brown leather satchel, like a doctor's bag. I thought, uh -huh. that's so wonderful. And I, just, yeah. and I opened it and the stench oh. just billowed up, the stench of like chemicals and things that had rotted and old dead animals and stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's so wonderful. You really shouldn't yeah. have. And he said, it was my father's and my grandfather's and now I want you to have it. I said, that's great. What'd your grandfather do? Yeah. He was a mortician. Uh, is that real? Yes, that is a true story. <laughs> Six, what is the last book you read? That I finished? Uh, Career of Evil um, by Robert Galbraith. Galbraith is terrific. I hope he keeps working. He's got a great future ahead of him. Yes. Seven. What one thing do you need to have in your fridge at all times? Um, eggs. Uh, I feel like if you've got eggs, you don't sure. really need. I mean, like eggs. Like, I mean, this is terrible. I, I'm like the most boring interview ever. It's like, what kind of ice cream do you like? Vanilla. Yeah. What do you have Strawberry. in your fridge? Yeah. Eggs. Yes, you are. No. <laughs> hey, what is, or it should be, who is your favorite filmmaker, director, slash director? Uh, St probably Steven Spielberg. And once again, I mean, it's like I just answered Vanilla. Uh -huh. But but the, here's the thing. If I named my five favorite films, four of them would be Spielberg films. Uh -huh. And the last would be like faux Spielberg. It would be Jaws. Um, E.T., Raiders, Close Encounters, and... In front of the Simpsons, and... Senior Spielbergo. <laughs> <laughs> His uh, biography of Monty Burns, right? Isn't that who he hired? <laughs> oh, uh, Let the Right One In, of course. Which is like E.T., if it's like E.T. reimagined if E.T. was a 12-year-old vampire. Right. Yeah. Uh, what is your dream car? Tesla. What is your secret snack? 
uh, I feel like lying about something just so I can have a good answer. I mean, like, it's just like another such. Uh -huh. I just, you know, thing is, is writers are kind of dull people. Like, it's all inside. It's what they do on the page that's right. interesting. I mean, English muffins. English muffins? Are Sorry, yeah, yeah, it's I just like English muffins, muffins, you know? It's like it gets to be 10 in the uh -huh. evening, it's late, and, you know, I throw an English muffin in. Do, what do you put on it? Butter. Butter? <laughs> Jam? No peanut butter? No. no. Locks? No, 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 no. Uh, 11. We're like to 11. We've blown the time here, but where do you, you are see keeping your, track? Where, uh, no. Okay. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, probably working the has been circuit. <laughs> you know, Wrong. going right around here. The, uh, <laughs> um, um, I, yeah, probably sitting in this reading room, what, yeah. reading a Paul Tremblay novel. And it would be like a hologram signing. Yeah, an actual, right. Yeah, yeah, actually, probably it wouldn't be reading a novel because yeah. that would be so old-fashioned. Just just, the it. novel would come as like a tablet, and I'd just be like, mm, mm, oh, that Paul Tremblay novel was so good. Mm, tasty. What, what item would you love to get your hands on if it went up for auction? A first folio? But I wouldn't be able to win the auction. It would be too expensive. But, a first, you know, Shakespeare mm. first folio, okay, I guess. Nice. I mean, I guess. I like it. What's your biggest pet peeve? Um, people being really judgmental on the internet. You wrote a novel about that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> mm. 14, what is your worst habit? That I'll admit to. <laughs> yeah. I guess um, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty narcissistic, you know, I like to, you know, I mean, what are people saying about the new book? Uh, right. What are people saying about it on Amazon? What are people saying about me on Twitter? It's like that old Bette Midler joke. That's enough about me. What do you think of me? <laughs> uh, mostly right, although I think your your worst habit is blaming chairs on your flatulence. <laughs> uh, 15, what was the last movie you saw in the theaters? Uh, last movie I saw in the theaters um, was Blade Runner 2049, which I thought, I thought beautifully lived up to the original. It was just as boring and pretentious <laughs> as the first one, you know, and, and so that's terrific. I'm glad they carried on the grand tradition. Nice. Uh, what color is your toothbrush? Blue. Wrong. Vermilion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any hidden talents? Uh... Uh, I could play Werewolves London on the piano. Oh, nice. Uh, 18, are you a morning person or a night owl? Morning person. Morning person. Yeah. Kind of neat. Kind of neat. I like to sleep. My, actually, yeah. my secret talent is for napping. Napping. You know, it's like sleeping late, nice little nap in the middle of the day, then go to bed early, like as soon as Jeopardy's over. All right. We're getting there. What cause is dear to your heart? Well... Um, when I, when I, um, a lot of my charitable giving is located around Donors Choose, um, which I highly recommend everyone, um, people support, that people should support and give to. On the other hand, I think the whole idea of, of Donors Choose is vaguely offensive. That's not the way a functioning civilization is supposed to work. Uh -huh. It's not supposed to be that teachers go on a website and beg for crayons and pens and rulers so their kids can learn, or right. books for their classrooms, or chairs to sit on, or the equipment. Functioning, caring civilizations make sure they have those things. But then you get into an issue about how, how do we make sure that teachers have the equipment they need to teach and instruct our young? That's difficult. Someone has to pay for it. Right. People don't like to pay for things in this country, you know? This is why we cannot have nice things. This is true. Uh, well, you're a, you're a teacher. I am. You're a teacher. I mean, what do you think would be better? Arguably, um, begging for supplies online. Like, I mean, this is like you know the joke of it is everything has become a GoFundMe campaign. Right. If you get sick, you better hope you have a thousand followers on Twitter. Yeah. Honestly, you know? it's one of the more depressing things. I mean, of all the depressing things on the internet, is how often you see a GoFundMe for someone who's uh, you know had an unexpected illness or unexpected. I mean, things, surgery or I mean, things have have gotten a little better under the Affordable Care Act. There is still a lot of work to be done, and no one is going to do that work. You know, it's clear that there mm -hmm. is too much dysfunction, too much anger, too many entrenched opinions for anyone to do the work necessary to provide quality health care to Americans. But we're seeing this across the boards. Infrastructure is crumbling. Uh, the power grid is ancient. 
Um, you know, education teachers never have enough supplies. They're paid uh, barely. The the pay is pathetic. They ought to be you know they ought to be paid well for what they do. Um, this is like I mean this is like it's supposed to be twenty two questions in two minutes, but I could <laughs> yeah. go on for a lot more than two minutes than this. Basically, nothing is free. And if you want to live in a country with great schools and a great healthcare system and working roads and high speed internet and high sp and and a functioning electrical grid and a, a rapid response to natural disasters, you got to pay for it. You know, there's got to be some, I should be paying higher taxes. You know, there is there's there is room for things to get better, but people got to want it. And so far, it does kind of look like a lot of Americans feel like, I got mine, I'm not going to worry about it. Then something bad happens and you're on GoFundMe hoping someone will donate right. your kidney. Way to bring us down, man. <laughs> I'm Sorry. Yeah, I know, I know. I just ruined what was. Uh, we were having a good time yeah, until then. Sorry. Right. Well, that's okay. Um, well, the hour, I guess, is coming close toward the end. I, I don't know. How are we, we going to wrap this up? I do want to say you all just secretly watched the pilot of the Joe and Paul show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pilot! If, if pilot. it goes well, you'll see us on, uh, geez, I don't know, Pick a Network. I think the networks are really fighting over this. Honestly. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, no, uh, actually, um, I've been getting uh, the, uh, I got some cool, uh, cool thing. Um, my comic book, Lock and Key, is, yeah. they're filming the pilot of it right now up in Nova Scotia. They just started filming Amazing. yesterday. I saw a bunch of footage and stuff. Looked awesome. That's great. It's, it's like, like they're filming in Nova Scotia at, on, like, not just the best week. Like, yesterday was maybe the most beautiful day of the year yeah. in Canada. You know, people are going to look at the footage and they're going to be like, there's no way. That's, that's CGI or it's a filter or something. CGI Canada. No filter. <laughs> when people see it, that's actually how it looked. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That's fun. I'm excited about that. Nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Was that we... a little bit of a cheer up from crumbling infrastructure yeah, and, and, you know, a GoFundMe page for kidneys? I would wrap up by saying I, I got, um, I had the opportunity to read Strange Weather this summer. And I, I honestly, it's one of my favorite books of yours that I've read. That's very um, kind. Thank you. And the, and the, the novella that you read from... Really, to me, it was just a showstopper. I mean, I love all the novellas, Thanks. but um, just how, how you weaved in. I, I, I don't want to bring people down again by talking about Alzheimer's, but I thought how you handled that in the opening uh, novella, really, as someone you know who lived through grandparents having to deal mm -hmm. with that, really, I don't know, I, you did it well. I, the grief and the anger sort of combination that those people experienced was, was um, authentic. Well, the main thing is, is that you can't really get even in real life, you know, in real life, a lot of terrible things happen, you know, you're going back to disasters, you know, your home is swept away by a hurricane, what are you going to do besides shake your fist at the sky? You know, you lose a loved one to Alzheimer's, you know, they lose right. everything and everything gets taken away. There's no one to fight. There's no way to get, there's no one to get even with. And one of the things you can do in fiction in the land of make-believe is you can take something like Alzheimer's and you can give it a face, in this case, this bad guy, the Phoenician, right. and we can give someone, to, we, can, we can give the reader someone to fight. And even if it's only make-believe, even if it's only pretend, hopefully, it, you know, it gives, you know, gives you something to feel good about for a little while. Yeah. You know, so anyway, well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you like the story. No, absolutely. Um, I don't know. You guys want to say bye to the people? I bye guess we should people. say goodbye. Bye to the people. <laughs> bye. Thanks. Hey, guys. Um, wait, let me, I think there's some information. Where can they go and buy? It's on the sheet of paper. Oh. Right. So, um, signed copies of this book are available at strangeweatherbook.com. Um, uh, so, um, that's strangeweatherbook.com, not getsomestrange.com, which is where that's actually an adult that's dating so cool, site right? for, yeah. for, uh, people looking to step out. Don't go there. Stay away from that. Go to strangeweatherbook.com. Um, and you can get, uh, you can get signed copies. I mean, I signed like 60 copies just in two hours. And, and that was and above just, the table. You should have seen it. Yeah, right. I mean, down below, I'm like, ah, so, um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm actually just thinking how that how much that clip's gonna look like I'm masturbating under the table. That's not so cool. So we found the perfect moment to wrap this up. Um, uh, thanks you so much, sure, Paul. No, thanks. That was tremendous. Thanks so much for talking to me. I enjoyed thanks it. For me. Um, check out Disappearance at Devil's Rock. Yeah, please do. Head full of ghosts. Wonderful books. Very scary. You will be very satisfied. Guys, be thanks. safe and be well. Bye. Happy Halloween. See you on Hulu in two weeks. No. <laughs>